Are folks able to see my screen okay? Yes. Beautiful. All right, we are here this morning to kick off ACO season here at the board with um, the budget hearing for three Medicare only ACOs, Allidade, Lore, and Vitalize. So we're just starting off with a quick staff intro and then we will hear from all three ACOs one after the other as they present their FY25 budget. We'll have time for staff and board questions, uh, questions from the healthcare advocate if there are any and take public comment. I wanted to take the time to ground us in um, what we are looking at today as far as ACO regulatory processes. It really depends on what type of ACO we're talking about. So on the left, we have ACOs that accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance. And on the right, we have ACOs that accept payments only from Medicare. And th these are the ACOs that we're talking about today. These are all three of them are Medicare Shared Savings Program ACOs, and they only contract with Medicare. So you can see from this flowchart on the right that there is not certification required for these types of ACOs, but there is a budget review required every year that they operate in Vermont. And then the next level goes to how many lives they have in Vermont, how many Vermonters are attributed to the ACO. And the threshold is 10,000 lives. And in the case of these th three ACOs, each one of them individually has fewer than 10,000 lives um, present in Vermont. And so that means that the standards and processes that the board follows um, really depend on what the board determines is appropriate. And lastly, I'll just note that there is a Medicare only ACO guidance. The budget guidance is reviewed uh, and approved annually by the board. And we took care of that earlier this spring. I'm going to pass it over to Mark Hengsler, our staff attorney, to walk us through the budget review process. Hey, I'm good sorry. morning, everybody. Oops. Can you hear me? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm the court reporter this morning. Hi. Good morning, Aaron. Hi, good morning. I just want to make sure and verify. I'm sorry, I was having some audio at first. So I want to make sure that we are not on the record at this point. Or were you under the understanding um, that I'm sorry? Yeah, we, we we can be on the record. If not, the most important part to be on the record is actually the hearing with the ACOs. Um, preferably, okay. we can be on the record now, though. You want to go ahead and be on the record. OK, and then I'll just note the That's time fine. that we're on the record at 9.08 a.m. Sorry about that, Aaron. Thank you. No, it's OK. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to walk us through three slides to give a legal overview of, of what we're doing today. I'll start with the baseline for how the statute and rule direct the board to review the budgets of Medicare-only ACOs. Starting point is at Rule 5.404A of the GMCB rules, which provides that an ACO has the burden of justifying its proposed budget to the board. However, in deciding whether to approve or modify the proposed budget of an ACO that's projected to have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives, which as Michelle stated earlier, is, is all three of the ACOs that the board is looking at today, the board takes into consideration the following. One, any benchmarks established under uh, section 5.402 of GMCB rule five, two, criteria listed at 18 VSA 9382B1 that the board deems appropriate to the ACO's size and scope. I'm going to loop back around to that one in about a minute. Three, the elements of the ACO's payer-specific programs and any applicable requirements of 18 VSA 9551. Hey, Mark, let me, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Let me interrupt. Who's ever 802-338-7438, please mute your phone. We can hear you. And could you please just mute? Seven four three eight, please. Thank you. All righty. Um, and for any other issues at the discretion of the board, so uh, feel free to hop to the next slide, Michelle. The when the board is looking at the budget of an ACO with 
more than 10,000 lives, the statutory criteria for budget review are all applicable. However, as I showed in the last slide, the board makes a determination about what criteria are appropriate for ACOs that have uh, less than 10,000 lives. So with that in mind, staff have some recommendations for the criteria the board might wanna consider uh, for these ACOs. These criteria are not changed from last year. This is what staff presented last year, but I'm gonna go ahead and read through these just to, to ground us in the items that staff believe are relevant for reviewing budgets for these ACOs. And these are all from 18 VSA 9382B1. That section of the statute has the big list of everything that's relevant for an ACO with more than 10,000. These are the select items within that list that staff believe are relevant for the ACOs we're looking at today. So first, information regarding utilization of the healthcare services delivered by healthcare providers participating in the ACO and the effects of care models on appropriate utilization, including the provision of innovative services. Two, the character, competence, fiscal responsibility, and soundness of the ACO and its principles. Three, any reports from professional review organizations. Four, the ACO's efforts to prevent duplication of high quality services being provided efficiently and effectively by existing community-based providers in the same geographic area, as well as its integration of efforts with the Blueprint for Health and its regional care collaboratives. Go ahead and hop to the next one, please. Thanks. Uh, four, public comment on all aspects of the ACO's costs and use and on the ACO's proposed budget. Five, information gathered from meetings with the ACO to review and discuss its proposed budget for the forthcoming fiscal year. Six, information on the ACO's administrative costs as defined by the board. Seven, the extent to which the ACO makes its costs transparent and easy to understand so that patients are aware of the costs of the healthcare services they receive. And finally, the extent to which the ACO provides resources to primary care practices to ensure that care coordination and community services, such as mental health and substance use disorder counseling that are provided by community health teams are available to patients without imposing unreasonable burdens on primary care providers or on ACO member organizations. Um, Michelle, I'm going to turn it back to you, I think, for the last slide. Great. Thanks, Mark. So this is just a quick timeline. So we received most of the ACO budget submissions on October 1st. Um, Vitalize did uh, request an extension, so we allowed them to submit their budget on November 1st. And then today, the 13th, we're here for all of those hearings. And next Wednesday, we will have a staff analysis and a potential vote on all three Medicare-only ACO budgets. Public comment is welcome. Um, uh, the public can submit comments um, by Monday, November 18th, to be considered ahead of the staff analysis presentation and the potential vote. And with that, um, I will hand it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you very much. Is my audio working okay, Erin or Susan? Sounds good to me. Yes, it is. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, and are the folks from Lore Health here? Yes. Good morning, Chairman Foster. I'm Mark Soccer from Lore Health, and Mark Atala also has joined. Yes. Good morning, and also Mr. Soccer, Mr. Atala. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll have our council swear you in, and I assume you're ready and prepared for your presentation. Uh, we are. Thank you. Great. All right, uh, Mr. Hanksler, would you mind swearing in the witnesses, and then um, Mr. Bryceiker, you can just take it over from there. Thank you. Yep. Uh, apologies. Just give me one moment to uh, pull up the language, which I should have done ahead of time, and uh, didn't do. So just grabbing it right now. All right, uh, for those who are going to be testifying on behalf of Lore, please go ahead and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. All right, thank you. You are sworn in. 
All right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I'm. Uh, we'll start with an introduction about lower. Uh, discuss a little bit on uh, uh, 2023 results and then hand it to uh, Mr. Atala for a discussion of the 2025 year budget. Um, uh, we are a, as, as as was shared earlier, a Medicare Shared Savings Program ACO. Uh, we're, we're a multi-partner, multi-state ACO. We have one partner in Vermont and we operate in four other states as well. Uh, we are, uh, Different from many ACOs in that our main focus is partnering with federally qualified health centers. This gives us a, uh, a, a unique population, which in course includes people on Medicare uh, when they become eligible at age 65, but also a, a significant uh, number of people who are dually eligible and as well as people on disabilities. And um, uh, we, we are we we, we uh, work with um, CMS and others, uh, and really the purpose of the whole budget is to to do the things where we can coordinate care, uh, improve that quality of care, and uh, and uh, um, uh, meet the uh, the objectives of the program. Um, in 2023, that was our first year, and uh, from a, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about uh, our. Um, quality and program work during that year. Um, it was a baseline year for us, um, um, and we were successful in coordinating, uh, collecting and coordinating the submission of, of quality performance data across the multiple EHRs and multiple partners uh, in the national ACO. Uh, we uh, came up came up with our baselines of performance in diabetes, hypertension and uh, the process of care, identification and process of care for depression. And uh, the uh, results of those data show that we do have, uh, first of all, we have very committed clinical partners who are deeply engaged in uh, their performance. Um, and, uh, and these data, uh, just one other additional note, uh, are for all their patients, not only their ACO patients, but for all their patients that they serve uh, we identified opportunities to improve in diabetes care, specifically in in uh, sending out reminders to help people come in for their visits and have the the status of their of their diabetes management uh, monitored. Uh, the same was true also for uh, for hypertension. Uh, um, Performing in diabetes uh, uh, and hypertension showed that really there was about 30% of our total patients that would benefit from additional focus around care coordination and uh, supporting them in, in their self-care of those conditions. And on the depression screen, we are working with our partners mainly in the area of helping them um, con configure their, their electronic health records so that they can capture the care that they are providing in a way that then um, can be reflected in our results. The um, the main focus of all of this is real, uh, of our other program with patients is just uh, supporting patients themselves in how what they can do uh, on an everyday basis to uh, t take small steps in improving self care, feel better about how they're getting through life, and have the energy and the empowerment to to be uh, taking control uh, in small ways of, of, of their uh, chronic medical conditions and their life overall. Let me, the last point I wanted to share is a, another report that we share with our partners is an opioid re use report that CMS provides to us. And uh, this is a report that, that just uh, informs practices of their patients who are on high doses of opioids and who are getting prescriptions from multiple providers. And we provide this uh, report to our partners who then uh, begin that, the outreach and um, the outreach so that they can uh, help that person begin to take small steps to, to get that also under control, uh, ideally getting to a single prescriber and then beginning to work on on the, the actual issues in play here so that so that that overall dose can be reduced and, and the risk of overdose can can also be reduced. And uh, it's it's a it's a small thing that we 
we are doing to, you know, as part of the broader, the broader uh, policy uh, approach in Vermont to address this really challenging problem. So with that background, uh, Mark Atala, I'm gonna hand it over to you to go over the uh, uh, 2025 year budget. Th thanks, Mark. Michelle, do you have slides that you will present, or do you want want us to share? Or we're happy just to talk through our budget. Um, I can, if you give me a moment, I can find your slides, but I was not prepared to present them. That, that's okay. Just wanted to check the process. Um, we can share if we're allowed to. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Super. Uh, so as part of our, um, and it's good to be with the board again. Um, so we have financial, um, results from 2023, uh, and they were really neutral at the ACO level. When we break that out, um, in terms of expenditures from Vermont, uh, we, we found, um, this is a truncated number, meaning, uh, the, the $9,500, uh, per year, um, uh, removes uh, the 99th percentile um, of cost. And so uh, this is our our set of results, I think, consistent with um, you know, what we uh, were expecting um, in terms of, of truncation. I think overall, um, overall results, uh, you'll see some projection changes for 2024 as well as 25 based on um, final year results from CMS, which uh, we're significantly just delayed this year relative to to previous years, just based on uh, a number of a number of things that um, has happened with CMS. Uh, in terms of of deltas, uh, we saw our final uh, attribution decline from our projection for 2023, uh, which um, has also uh, led led us re to revise our 2024 and 2025 budget, um, <clears throat> and with that. It can, consistent with that number month reduction. Um, we're presenting uh, a truncated uh, expenditure number now in terms of beneficiary expenditures. So um, that's important because it's not a uh, it's not a total uh, expenditure. Uh, and so you know we're happy to um, answer any questions there uh, and how how you ask us to present because uh, in terms of shared savings or losses, it's based off of a truncation. And so for purposes here, it, uh, we chose to, to make that consistent. Um, our projected savings uh, for 2024 and then also 2025, we've, we've revised based on um, 2023 performance. And uh, you'll, you have that, uh, that budget proposal as well. Um, you know, obviously we, we hope to, to uh, perform um, better in 2024 and 2025, um, but I think we're uh, we're realistic in terms of uh, what can be done, uh, and this is really a a, a process uh, that we're committed to in terms of improving care and 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 building foundations to to deliver savings over the long term. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions from the board and the public. I'll start with um, staff, if staff has any questions. Thank you. Um, we only had one question, and that was whether you are able to share um, the Vermont specific providers performance as far as shared savings or losses is concerned. Um, and if you're not able to do so in a public setting, submitting the answer in writing is perfectly fine. We can certainly submit. I mean, we, I think you you have our expenditures. I think benchmarking is such a complicated process because it's you're reviewing, you know, a number of factors around risk ratio, et cetera, that, you know, we wouldn't, um, I think, segmenting out Vermont um, separate from CMS, which CMS doesn't provide us Vermont specific data, you know, really wouldn't be precise. And I don't know that it would um, uh, further uh, we we don't we don't see you know substantial differences between Vermont and our overall performance, so I think from a specific 
benchmarking perspective, we don't, um, you know, we're not, we're not expecting uh, that big of a direct, but I, I, expenditures for, certainly, and that's what you have, and that's what we've been able to segment. I think benchmarking is a counterfactual, and um, it's just something that CMS doesn't doesn't provide us. They provide us ACO wide um, data, and so I think it would be hard for us to produce true risk ratios and true trend factors specific to Vermont only um, for those reasons. Uh, you know, we don't have catheter fraud, et cetera. We don't have access to that type of um, that type of analytics or data that CMS runs over over an, a very long period. Um, but Michelle, does that hopefully that 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 helps at least? Sure. Thank you very much. That's all, Chair Foster. Thank you. And I'll turn to uh, the other board members for any questions they may have. I can start with one quick question. So I was looking at your just eyeballing the target uh, PBPY of ninety five twenty four. Is that that's your whole, that's your all of the ACO? It's all states combined. Your national that, target. That, that that's that's actual expenditures truncated in Vermont uh, for twenty three. Expenditures uh, or or target? I guess that's ex expenditures. So um, so we so we we can see expenditures in twenty three. Uh, so it, not not even not even a target. It was it was actual truncation for us. So we um, and then we use that really for trending, based on what we can see for twenty twenty four so far, and then trending that forward to twenty twenty five. Um, but it, it's that is only that is only Vermont specific. Tell me if that makes sense. So we we looked at the essentially who was attributed to us in twenty three, and what their truncated expenditures were. And that's the the ninety five twenty four. And then just maybe so you can help me understand a little better. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to figure out shared savings, is it based on that target? All right, and shared so? savings is yeah, shared savings is uh, um, not even so. Again, that that is a true expenditure. So like that's what the target is set uh, across the ACO. And so what CMS is is essentially doing is they're um, they're taking beneficiaries. They have a historically, uh, they have historical expenditures of those beneficiaries, um, and we have a, a, like us and other ACOs here. We have a historical benchmark uh, for us because our, our performance year started in twenty three. Uh, that historical benchmark is weighted sixty percent twenty two, thirty percent twenty one, and ten uh, percent twenty uh, twenty. And so. Um, what CMS does is they'll uh, give us that number, and then they trend it forward, uh, and then also risk ratio adjust it. So they're looking at you know our our population, and they're doing it by three or by four different types of populations. So ESRD, disabled, uh, patients with both Medicare and Medicaid, and then patients with just Medicare. Um, there's risk caps associated with that. So if the risk score in one area goes up by more than three percent, that's capped. If the risk score goes down, there's no actual downside cap. And so what's happening is you're um, taking your initial number, uh, your initial benchmark, your which is your which is your target. Um, and again, for us, that's an ACO wide target, so it's not Vermont specific. Um, and then you're having to perform both risk ratio adjustments and then also a trend um, factor adjustment. There's other parts, uh, and this uh, you know CMS uh, had this issue this year. Um, there was some fraud that they removed from expenditures. They, if there's other payments around uh, DISH, uh, GME, um, they remove those from claim. I mean, there's a there's a a, a very large process that's um, had you know tens of millions of dollars uh, applied to it to try to come up with what is a good counterfactual. Um, and that's that's the target we get. But that targeted for us is. Um, is done at an at an ACO wide level, not at a um, patient or Vermont specific level. Um, and so when I when we show the ninety five twenty four, what that's showing is you know here was our here was our trunk here was our expenditures after applying a, essentially a stop loss of truncation of national expenditures at the 99th percentile. So not Vermont specific again, but um, they apply that 
to remove outlier claims essentially so that benchmarks are uh, slightly closer to um, uh, you know an expected result. Uh, that, that was a lot of words, but does that I think, help? It, was, I, I think it was helpful uh, for me. Yes. Uh, can I just ask you one question about the the fraud? Are you talking about sure. this catheter fraud issue yeah. that was? And, and my understanding of that issue, it was not involving any patients within Vermont, but there were some Vermont patients outside of Vermont that there was apparently fraudulent catheter claims towards. Is that your understanding of it? Yeah, our, our understanding is uh, not, um, you know, we, it's not, uh, it, it was a pot, it was a, around 3 billion plus of expenditures that, um, were identified. Uh, it seems to have been random beneficiaries. If, if maybe um, if Vermont was was not chosen as part of that list, that's good. Um, and I think what what it showed in, in 2023 was, you know, people were seeing expenditures that that weren't there. And so, you know, if they were if if in that case, you know, if an ACO either showed better projections than they were expecting, it could be because the you know others in the in the um, in the, in the overall population, their costs were going up at a faster rate than areas that the catheter fraud wasn't happening. Um, and so, you know, I think we, I think our understanding was it resulted in like a half percent or so uh, reduction in um, in savings uh, for ACOs. But that's uh, that's at a broad national level, not Vermont specific. But but that's our that's that's our understanding of the catheter fraud piece. Thank you. Sure. Hi, this is Robin. I have a couple of questions. Um, in your submission, and I think we might have talked about this a little bit last year, um, you had mentioned that you provide beneficiaries with in-kind incentives, and I wondered if you could give us some examples of how beneficiaries might uh, benefit from those type of incentives, like what kind of incentives are they? Sure. I'm happy to start. Um, so, I, I, and I think to clarify one one comment that was made earlier um, was around ACO cost of beneficiaries or ACO costs in general. Uh, th there aren't costs uh, for beneficiaries, uh, at least in, in terms of the shared savings program. Uh, and I'm not aware of other other costs in, in Medicare only ACOs that patients would ever bear. Um, so our, our view on in kind incent incentives is uh, where allowable under the regulations and and law um, if if there's if there's areas where uh, beneficiaries can um, improve their health uh, that are, are not covered by Medicare, um, and that for us um, you know makes sense to uh, to help patients with, um, and then our core example probably is food, uh, so healthy food, um, then that's an area that uh, we try to to fill gaps in, um, and so that that um, member loves that would be our our core in kind incentive. That's not something covered by Medicare today. That's interesting. So how do you do that? Do you give them a grocery voucher or like how do you provide that as an incentive? Uh, Farmers the, market voucher? Yeah, the, they have they have a they receive a card that's that's locked down to um to only only grocery stores. Um yeah. and so that's uh that's how we were administrating it, similar to other others. So we hope we hope it works uh, at farmers markets and so. Great, thank you. Um, I think I just had uh, one or two other questions. Take a quick look. Um, so in your submission, um, you talked about uh, partnering partnering with local community based organizations to help patients access care. And I know your network in Vermont is very small. Um, is who are you partnering in terms of local community-based organizations outside of your provider network in Vermont? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Robin. Um, we work with Senior Solutions, and they um, they they support when they're meeting with people who uh, may be eligible for Medicare. They ask about that. We set up a, a process where they can actually, in that moment, check to see if that person is a patient 
that um, um, that's in our ACO. And if they are, then they they help them uh, with uh, and inform them of the ways they can they can actually uh, uh, get the additional in kind benefits that Mr. Atala was just speaking of. Uh, thank you. I think that's my only question. Hey, good, good morning. This is Tom and um, thanks for being with us again this year. Um, I know from the discussion earlier that it's difficult um, to. To segment out um, Vermont, but I'm wondering if um, if you're meeting your savings targets. As an overall ACO and in Vermont, um, I imagine you'd be interested in knowing that because Vermont's already a low. Medicare state, so it may be harder to meet the targets, but could you comment on um, how you're doing with the savings targets, please? Sure. Um, so for 23, we were within um, our, our med uh, essentially minimum savings and minimum loss rate. And so we had a our overall benchmark um, was two, 221 million, uh, 221.7 million. Our expenditures were 222 million. 222.3 million, so um, like a 0.2% uh, loss. And so from that end, we view that as neutral because it's a, you know, statistically um, yep. not relevant. So I, I think from our, from our, in terms of how we think about savings, what we, what we really use is every quarter CMS provides us with um, quarterly benchmark uh, updates. Um, and that again, that's at the overall level. So we we tend to look at things just because we are operating in multiple states um, with one entity, which might be different for other partners. Um, we tend to look at things at, at the overall ACO level, um, and then we then we we do look at expenditures, um, you know, and how expenditures themselves are trending. So how claims are coming in for Vermont specific um, beneficiaries. And so I think we don't necessarily look at Vermont's costs as low or high because it's it's really a relative um, question. So they're, they're you know those patients if their costs are low now or wherever they are now relative to other others in the country, their benchmarks were also low. And so it's a question of you know how does trend work in Vermont versus elsewhere, and those things are all accounted for in creating the target um, really for you know for future years. And so I think. Um, you know, we we let that play out, and I think from our end, our focus is how do we um, how do we focus on the, you know the things that uh, we hope um, you know align fully with uh, the the blueprint and the the board. Uh, so we have some core quality measures, um, so diabetes, hypertension, um, depression screening, and follow up. You know, I think uh, oh. Dr. Go ahead. Sorry. Yep, sorry, Mark. Um, I want to ask about quality in a second, but sure. and, and I, I appreciate the explanation and I'm trying to get my head around it. But it's still not clear to me if you're if you're meeting the your savings targets. Yeah, so our expenditures for twenty three, um, in terms of target, it, it, I think over it's overall benchmark, right? I think is your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so right. So we we did not meet. Um, CMS has projected benchmark of um, 221.7 million. Our expenditures were 222.3 million, which is again about two about 0.2 percent delta. Yeah. Um, because of that, we but we are our risk contract. Uh, um, we've chosen a, a half percent up and down um, savings and loss rate, which means that there's no dollars from us to CMS and no dollars from CMS to us uh, in that in that band, and so. Um, you know, this is our first year to see how, you know, at, at the aggregate level, um, our target was going to be set. And, you know, I think we, um, you know, 23 was an interesting year for a number of reasons, but, um, I think when we expect, when we see a neutral result for us, um, you know, for us, that means the, at least the benchmark is, is functioning, um, mm -hmm. as expected, you know, as we'd hope. And yep. so, um. I think it allows us to to really work from there to say, you know, what are the things that we can do? But I'll I'll hand it back to you for the quality questions or other other follow up. 
No, thank you, Mark. That make it makes sense, right? Coming out of the pandemic, things getting back to normal. Now you have um, a benchmark that you can try to work with. Um, that's probably more accurate, more um, predictable going forward. So thank you for the explanation. I sure. I appreciate that detail and and just the straightforwardness. Um, similarly, with the quality, are you meeting the your quality um, targets? So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, thank you, Mr. Walsey. Uh, 2023 was the year where we actually uh, were able to get the results to set our, our benchmark in terms of where we are. We reviewed that with the, uh, with the governing body of the ACO. Uh, they're very engaged in now uh, in, in every organization uh, taking those, that information and and looking to uh, looking to their own clinical care processes on how on how they can improve. I, I'll give you one example. Um, we, you know, this is common across all our partners. Uh, but in the diabetes measure, um, you know, thirty percent of patients um, they did they the 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 clinic did not have a record of the patient's hemoglobin A one C, which is a blood test that lets a person. Mm -hmm. No, no. In in very general terms, I you know the clinician in me it says you know I look at it and say it's not not the greatest test in the world, but it mm -hmm. does give you some sense. And so there was thirty percent of patients that just did not have that performed, or they did not have record of it. So that's yeah. the type of outreach now that they're doing to call those people, check in, see how they're doing, uh, get them in for a visit, help them help them get in if they have trouble with that. And and in that visit, they can then uh, measure and then act on that measurement. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. I, um, the thirty percent without a measure strikes me as as high. I'm used to yeah, seeing. Yeah, sorry, uh, just one one clarification. So that's either thirty percent, either without a measure, or they're above nine. Um, okay. Apologize. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, and okay. I. It, that's. It, I was, I was, just in response to your, it seems as high, um, you know, having, having done this for, for a number of years, especially in the first year, you begin to have visibility into that. Um, that's actually not a surprising number for me. And especially in our, in our particular population where, where, you know, our, our clinical partners are, are caring for people in across a broad swath of, of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Uh, homelessness. Uh, that the reality is that th they have a lot of really hard things going on in their lives, and mm -hmm. for the individual to have the time and energy to even focus on that and prioritize that when they're just thinking about where am I sleeping, what am I eating, you know, do, what, what's the status of my job, do I have a job, etc. That that's that's challenging. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, I really have a lot of respect for the clinical. The clinical outreach and work that our FQHC partners are doing. Yeah, and, 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 I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Roll. No, uh, please, just, please. just one clarification too um, for context. As you, I think you look at other ACOs. Uh, when we reported quality for twenty, the quality you see across the ACO over twenty three, um, what what twenty three required was essentially all uh, all patients, regardless of payer. So it's not a Medicare only um, a quality measure. Uh, and so one of our partners is a large uh, academic center and, um, you know, let's say patients are attributed to them through specialists. Uh, if those specialists aren't performing A1C, but they're attributed, you know, they won't, uh, that won't be counted. And so, you know, I think when we look at Vermont specific, uh, we're, we're better than that. And I think, um, you know, we, we, we've shared that data. We we're now really on a quarterly, um, model with our partner in Vermont, uh, and other partners. That really help build up quality throughout the year to say how 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 are we doing a, a, rather than a one time result, uh, you know after the year, um, mm -hmm. so that just context wise, um, what's being measured is a, a, is changing a little bit uh, in, in at least Medicare. Yep. Well, um, first I, I prefer Tom, um, so please yeah. please call me Tom, um, and I appreciate the context. Um, I understand the 30%, I think, is um, when I mentioned that that seemed high, that was, um, I'm used to seeing the proportion of patients with an A1C greater than nine. 
Mm. Um, so now that that's yeah. included in there, that it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, what I'm, what I didn't see in your submission, and what I'm interested in with the savings at and quality is the trend over time, right? And I know that you're just starting, but um, some of the quality measures that our staff shared with us, um, lore was below um, the median above peers, a uh, uh, median of peers. Um, and I don't see that as good or bad this early in your involvement um, and with Vermont, but um, watching it over time would be very helpful to us. Yeah. And so if when you when you come back, being able to to share whether you're meeting savings targets, whether you're meeting um, quality targets and with, where you're not, what are your plans to address those those areas? Um, that would be really helpful to to um, me and I think to us um, as a board going forward. So um, thank you for your the context you provided and your answers. And um, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll hold public comment till all three of the Medicare only ACOs have been completed as that's what's noticed. Um, so I don't think we have anything else from the board. Is there anything else from you, Mr. Atal or Bryce Eicher? I, I think the only item and uh, you know maybe worth uh, something something later. I think we want to understand uh, budgetary impact if there's changes to uh, overall number of ACOs and where lives are attributed. In um, in Vermont uh, in 2025 or after 2025, and so specifically, if one care exits, um, how that may impact uh, essentially uh, administrative costs or administrative um, percentages to other ACOs that operate. I we won't, we uh, probably not the right forum, but we want to at least flag it uh, for understanding. That's something that we're um, we're interested in. Uh, good question. No. Yeah, um, I think that's probably a discussion to have with staff offline. Um, it may take a little bit of uh, back and forth and consideration, but but thank you for flagging it. Ms. Sawyer, did you have anything else? No, I was just making myself available to say that we are working on that very issue on our end, try to sort it out ourselves. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, and it looks like the Allidaid team is is here. Is that correct? Yes, we are. Yes, good morning. Okay. Good morning. Um, I am going to personally abstain from um, uh, this overview and the vote on Allidade. And Member Walsh has kindly agreed to uh, act as the acting chair for your hearing. And so I'm going to step aside and have Member Walsh uh, lead this portion of today's hearing. And then we'll take a break after that and I'll come back for the last ACO. So thank you, Member Walsh, for stepping in, and um, I'll be back after this. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, and good morning. Um, Michelle, did you have um, any introductory remarks before we uh, shift to Allidaid? I do not. Okay. Um, then please uh, proceed with your um, presentation. And what we'll, uh, what we'll do uh, briefly uh, is, is administer the oath to those who are going to be presenting. So if everybody from Allidade who's going to be speaking or maybe speaking could turn your cameras on. I will and, be uh, if, if you have them <laughs> and then uh, unmute yourselves and, and raise your right hands. What I'm going to do is I'm going to administer the uh, the oath for witnesses. And what I'll do is I'll read it. Uh, you can say I do uh, and then we'll we'll proceed from there. Uh, okay. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Yes. All right. You are sworn in, and I'll turn it over to Allidade for presentation. Matt, are you going to pull up the slides, or do you want me to just start talking? Yeah. Oh, um, can you see them? Yep, yes. I can. Okay. And did you want to say anything, Matt, or did you want me just to go ahead? Yeah, if, if you want to jump in, yeah, appreciate it. Okay. Um, 
Good morning, everyone. Krista Sperry. I am the market president here at Allidade for our New England market. I've been with the company for just about three and a half years, so it's very nice to be presenting with you all this morning, and we are extremely excited about the opportunity to be bringing our New England ACO to the Vermont um, state. So Matt, if you don't mind moving along, um, this is just our motto, do more good for patients, society, life. Um, and I think you skipped a slide for me, Matt. There we go. Right. That's okay. <laughs> you, can, you can go past that. That's just our motto. <laughs> um, all right, so um, the ACO that we are bringing to the state of Vermont in 2025 is called our Allidate Accountable Care ACO 205. It is an MSSP enhanced track ACO. The first performance year for this ACO is uh, currently happening. So 2024 is when this ACO started here at Allidade. It consists this year, you can see of the board comp compensation there of 13 members of our practices throughout four of the states this year in New England. So that's Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Maine. Uh, in 2025, we are looking to add the Richford Health Center into this ACO in Vermont. And so we would have five of the six states in New England. There are no participants today, nor do we anticipate any uh, in 2025 in Rhode Island. I'm, any questions about the overall ACO? Otherwise, I'm going to let Elisa jump in and we'll skip to the next slide and discuss a little bit more about Allidade. Good morning, everybody. I'm Melissa Collinson. I'm the National Director of Strategic Markets for Allidade, and we thought it might be helpful to get kind of an overall context about um, our who Allidade is, what we do, how we operate a little bit, because it does apply to, we're not, um, we're we're a little bit regional specific as far as like regional needs and our um, and how we serve our partners, but um, our overall we do have 44 in 2023 44 ACOs across the country, so it might be helpful to kind of understand our ethos and how we work. Um, this slide here is just to help you understand. Um, we have a designation as a public benefit company, which is something that is um, legally embedded into our legal structure, which basically says that what Allidade does with our resources at the end of the day, how we invest them, um, has to be aligned with our mission, which, as Krista said, is to um, you know serve our practices, serving their patients, um, and then um, do, doing better for all of them, and that will be better for society overall. And we do that through the vehicle of preventative primary care in the MSSP program. Um, so this is something we did two, you, that's fine, Matt, you can stay here. It's something we did two years ago, um, and you can look up about it if you're more interested in it. But it basically makes us as close to a nonprofit as you can be with um, actually having the resources to be able to reinvest back into our ACOs and their communities that they serve. We do the work of MSSP um, through very specific um, actions. We call it the core four, but MSSP really is a long-term game of delivering really high quality preventative primary care, which um, as we know, the community health centers, we serve over um, currently 314 community health centers in the country, and they are doing this work. It's just helping them be more efficient and um, helping get um, even more close to real-time information to them and then also supporting them with boots on the ground and a team to surround them clinically and operationally. Next slide. So this is a little bit about the teams that surround our partners, um, whether it's with uh, independent, small independent, you know, one doctor primary care practices on very rural areas or with larger multi-specialty groups. We provide you with a practice transformation specialist, local medical directors that really are engaging the clinical side of value-based care, and then a team of experts behind the scenes. We have incredible policy experts that work closely um, with federal, state, and local um, policies that impact on the delivery of primary care. And then we also um, do a lot of analytics behind the scenes. We have over um, 
about over 2,500 or more in growing um, practices with Allidaid and TINs that we need to always be looking at to make sure that they're in the right ACOs to make sure they're getting the, the greatest um, outcomes that we can possibly deliver with them in partnership. We also have market presidents such as Chris Desperi. Um, we have market leaders and um, teams of you know, technology experts behind the scenes that are taking suggestions from our partners to improve the population health tool that we give them. Go ahead. So Allidaid, as Krista mentioned, um, the 205 New England ACO is an enhanced tract MSSP. And um, Allidaid really only has our ACOs in either track E or enhanced. Um, that is basically because our model of how we um, create shared savings is all about aligned incentives. We don't have any hidden fees. We don't have any charges for extra support that we do with a lot of our in quotes wraparound services that we um, give um, to our, our partners. We um, very much are transparent in how we do our split. It's, we don't take any operational costs off the top before the shared savings split. We just purely split shared savings that is received to the ACO from CMS 50-50. So it's, we are incentivized to, as I said in the beginning, put our resources into our ACOs to make sure that they're doing as best as possible and either in track E or enhanced. Um, that we really try to move our practices in ACOs or whole ACOs sometimes at a time into enhanced as quickly as possible because that is the one track where Medicare keeps 25% of the upside and the 75% comes back to the ACO. Go ahead. I mentioned the population health tool that we have. We call it the Halidate app. It's not really an app, but um, it's easier to say than the population health tool. And um, we provide, as I said, everything free. We pay for all the integrations. We are pretty much EHR agnostic at this point. We work with over 120 different EHRs. And um, our, our teams are experts in um, the, the EHRs that we integrate with. It's usually about a 60 to 90 day implementation um, time period. We are in constantly on two week sprints improving it by the suggestions of our users. We have an 88% um, use rate per day, which is, I think, shows that our practices and their support staff um, find it useful and are using it to, to get um, insightful information and helpful information. Here, I wanna mention that it is a team-based tool. It is not only focused on just what's at point of care. There is one part of it called the daily huddle that is point of care that really provides information at the point of care, um, not only you know integrated and put together from the um, data within the clinic's four walls, but bringing in um, four, claim, four feeds of claims, um, pharmacy, fill, hospital, and lab from outside, and specialty information so that right all in one place on in one screen, you can see all that information about the patient um, and, and speak to it directly. There's a lot of various workflows that really to support staff that just make their time more efficient. As you know, community health centers have a workforce shortage that they're struggling with and providing efficiency to the work that they're doing is very important. Next slide, please. This is just another kind of uh, visual of what the app focuses on um, and, and its overall rating as well. We've done, it's very much um, used and appreciated by our tiny little practices and our very much larger ones as well. Next slide. Um, so we also have um, very a focused point to deliver customized um, patient outreach services and also help um, engage the right patients at the right time. This is opt-in. You don't, the, it's clinics and practices do not have to participate in these. Um, most choose to opt-in because it's very efficient for them and most of them don't have the resources to do this themselves. So we do this for them. Um, examples being right now, we have Healthy for the Holidays that ramps up, which is to try to get um, uh, patients in for their, you know, annual wellness visits before the holidays take over. And, and uh, so we really focus really at the 
um, all throughout the year, but we do have this kind of ramped up focus towards the end of the year to get the patients in for their annual wellness visits. Next slide. This is just um, a list uh, of some of the solutions and services and resources that we provide. I won't read them off to you, but we do have a part of Allidaid, and this is again, all at no cost. Um, we have a part of Allidaid, it's called Allidaid Plus, that does, if it's appropriate and you choose to opt in for your patient populations. Um, we have a comprehensive advanced care planning program. We have a kidney care management program if you're, you have patients that need a specific focus on that. Um, all sorts of other things um, that we, we look at and focus on. We're very data-driven, so that clinical trials piece um, is is interesting. I, I am very interested in data driven decisions, and we look at that a lot. If we do not ask our partner practices to do any extra focus on work. When I talked about the core four, we have looked at our data over ten years in the MSSP program and seen the very specific things that drive shared savings and good patient outcomes. Um, so we focus on the things that we know are providing value to the patients and then providing value back to our ICO partners as well. Next slide, please. So we joined early um, and you, we, we heard you asking overall um, results as far as our ACOs versus other MSSP ACOs and are we hitting target? Um, so Allidaid, as I mentioned, has 44 ACOs. And this is just to say, this is 2022 data. We're updating the slide with 23 data right now. Um, but currently, um, or in 2022, Allidaid's, all of our Allidaid cohort ACOs, so taking that in the MSSP program, we perform at, and this is me measured by shared savings rate, um, an average uh, across our track E and enhanced ACOs of 10.4% is our average um, shared savings rate. And then um, other ACOs in the MSSP program, so all non allidate ACOs, their average is a 2.7% shared savings rate. Our quality scores overall also are um, higher than the average um, score. Again, this is 2022. To be transparent, in 2023, which the data that we just got, we were just slightly higher than the uh, other average, um, and I think the average overall decreased in the MSSP program with quality. And I believe it's because of what Mark mentioned is the kind of across all payers reporting, which is a little bit more complex and difficult um, to do across ACOs, um, which we do the quality reporting for our ACO partners. Next slide. And I will um, let my colleague, Kevin, take over from here. Uh, good morning. I'm Kevin Devlin. I'm the Senior Director of Finance here at Allidaid. <clears throat> so uh, currently what you're looking at is our, our projection for 2025 savings based on the Accountable Care, Allidaid Accountable Care uh, ACO 205. Uh, our, as uh, Chris had mentioned earlier, this is majority of the practices that are in this ACO are beginning their second year. Uh, so we do have good data on potential uh, targets for the benchmark um, since we will be entering PY2 of this ACO. That target benchmark is uh, $13,605. We anticipate about a 4% savings versus that benchmark for the entire ACO next year for a savings just over $2 million. Um, that savings is essentially based off of the estimated tailwind that we are projecting for when the Vermont comes into this ACO, uh, utilizing their historical um, expenditures uh, and aggregating and estimating based off of the current ACO's performance. Uh, generally, year one and two ACOs see improvement around two and a half percent from the targeted tailwind. Uh, for So that's how we are calculating to that, but just under 4% uh for this ACO for 2025 which would be just slightly up from what the ACO is experiencing this year in 2024 based off that that estimation by about 50 basis points and so that summarizes our formal presentation I think we'll take any questions
Thank you very much. You. Open it up for board questions. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions at this time. I have a couple questions. Um, just gonna get myself a little organized here. Um, so on page 10 of your submission, um, in answer at the end of section three, you had talked about um, ACOs that report quality data can meet quality performance standard through one of three pathways, achieving a health equity adjusted quality performance score. And then you spoke about the three electronic clinical quality measures. Um, and But I didn't see the third pathway. So I wonder if you could just clarify that. And if you'd rather take that back and clarify uh, with staff later, that's totally fine. Just wanted to make sure I understood your submission. I think um, so we owe um, the the staff a few follow up questions next week, and um, we can we can take this one back. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and you did answer one of my questions. I was curious to learn more about the opt in to the additional services that you mentioned. Um, why would you say that a practice would or wouldn't want to opt into the additional services that you offer? Yeah, I can speak to that and Krista jump in too if you feel like it. Um, so sometimes there's like, for instance, comprehensive advanced care planning is a sensitive topic, and you work with um, very small physician practices that have very close relationships to their patients. And they may feel that they don't want Allidade's team who they focus purely on the comprehensive advanced care planning and having um, a social worker, a lawyer, um, all of the family members present is about a two week process. Um, but there's some practices that feel like I would rather keep that conversation with myself and my patient and not have Allidade's team do that. So um, same for, you know, comprehensive events, um, not I'm a, sorry, kidney, um, the CKD stuff that we do. There's just some doctors that feel like I have a better relationship and close with my patient. And even though we work on soft handoffs and all of that, we want to leave that choice to the practice. We don't want to dictate how they do their um, patient work. Yeah, and I would just add overall, and Elisa's absolutely right, um, we're not a one size fits all. We kind of meet our practices where they are. And overall, some practices are staffed much differently than other practices. So we have some practices that utilize all our services um, just because of staffing issues, or some practices go through periods of time where they might lose um, uh, uh, an excessive amount of staff and can't keep up with some of the back office um, kind of activities that that help them be successful in value-based care. So we're here to support them in those times when they need extra help. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I'm wondering if you are familiar with Vermont's Blueprint for Health program, which is our statewide uh, advanced practice, medical home and community health team structure. Um, and uh, because one of the questions that I have about your model, particularly with the wraparound services, is whether they are duplicative of or supplemental to the blueprint and how to ensure that your work supporting the practice and what's already happening in the community with the state community health team, make sure that that's all working together and not at cross purposes. So uh, if you are familiar with the blueprint and have any thoughts on how your model meshes or doesn't mesh with it, that would be helpful. And if not, um, then I guess I would simply ask if you'd be willing to take the blueprint for health orientation so that we can ensure that your care model doesn't uh, conflict with the state's care model, which is a requirement in our regulatory process. So I'm, I'm familiar with it just from, you know, uh, learning Vermont and learning it, I will say, uh, our, I think all of us would like to do that. Our, our clinical medical director in New England um, lives in New Hampshire um, and has 
worked um, there for many, many years, and I'm sure she's been more familiar with it. But for, for myself, I'm definitely willing, and I'm sure our teams would be willing. I will say one of the first things that we do in when a practice signs with us is get to know the practice for those very reasons, because we don't want to be duplicative of things that are working. Um, we want to um, help them find the areas where there's opportunity to improve and, and su provide support in those areas. It doesn't make sense to kind of reinvent the wheel. Great, that's great to hear. Uh, Seth, I think we have a couple more questions. Um, so when you, so in your submission, you talk about high value referral management. Could you explain what you mean by high value referral management? It's on page 15, if that's helpful. Crystal, I'll let you take that one. I don't know if I'm the right person to take it. I might ask Matt if that's one of the follow up questions that we're supposed to be. And it's totally fine. Again, anything happy to have you follow up if that's easier. I'm, I'm trying to pull up the page quickly so I can just read it. So. Yeah, one moment. I'm trying to locate the. We had a... um, it's on page 15 under the paragraph that is the first paragraph of care management. We use data to help patients get the best care that complements the care they receive from their PCP. This includes high value referral management as well as comprehensive advanced care planning. I, I think, think I what understand what it might be, but I'm not sure what would make a particular referral more or less high value. So that's what I was interested in learning is how you, uh, how you understand that. I think these are overall um, Allidae general statements. I think for New England, Krista, as, as an ACO matures, um, they they might move into more of that, but I don't know if Krista's ACO is doing that currently. Yeah, we don't do referral management today in the New England ACO. I think to Elisa's point, we have piloted in other parts of the country. Um, and maybe that's where it was high value. I, I don't know exactly how the, um, that was termed or why they termed it that way, but um, I'm thinking it's maybe uh, directed towards something like that, but we can definitely follow up on that as well and, and just confirm. We did have an area of the app. We actually um, took it down recently, but it was about like basically the clinicians could go in and type up a specialty and find um, across various different sources um, how specialists were performing in their area and where they're located and um, not just performing as far as like uh, outcomes, which are, of course, are important, but also looking at like total cost of care and those sorts of things. And we don't do not have that currently live in the app anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had one more question. So, um, in terms of your focus on health equity, um, I'm certainly. The focus on racial equity as part of health equity is very important. It's an area uh, in Vermont where obviously as a mostly white state, we have certainly um, things to improve. But in Vermont, we've also been looking at health equity a little more broadly, trying to look at rurality or uh, like the social needs index socioeconomic issues, those sorts of things. So I was just curious to hear about your definition of health equity and whether you tail that, tailor that to different locations or uh, sort of how you think about that. Yes, um, we have to. We have a health equity team and we do have to tailor it and come to very specific areas. For instance, um, our Mississippi a ACO, you know, very um, populations that have huge access issues and are in food deserts, et cetera, all the things that can impact um, rural areas. And it's our high, one of our highest performing ACOs. Um, so we are very proud of the work that we do with the social needs um, of the populations. We really tailor it to the specific areas. Like for instance, if it's a access issue, um, we in some areas where Uber is available, so not rural, but we partnered with Uber to get patients to the physicians. In some areas, it's um, you know helping them with 
creating clinical food pantries so that patients can access, um, you know, specific nutrition for their specific chronic diseases. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Um, nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I just um, have a couple questions also. Um, one, the um, I appreciate it. I appreciate you addressing savings and quality in your presentation. On slide, on slide twelve, you had a graph um, about savings targets, um, and if I'm wondering if you could pull that back up. One moment. Yeah, sure. Take your time. Um, and this is mostly just to help educate me personally. Could you help me understand the, um, how I should interpret the 10.4 yeah, versus so, 2.7? Yeah, um, so that's shared savings rate. So um, the rate at which you are creating shared savings. In the slide that Kevin went over, which is I think the one after this, where the MSR, that's a minimum shared savings rate. So for this ACO 205, it's an enhanced ACO. And in the enhanced track with MSSP, you are allowed to um, choose your minimum shared savings rate. Some ACOs um, in tracky, you um, cannot choose it um, and it gets set by um, Medicare. So let's say it's a 2% MSR. If your shared savings rate is um, 1.9, even if you're in track E where, um, you know, there's downside and upside, Medicare, Medicare keeps all of that, doesn't give you any of it back. You have to get over that, you know, ceiling that's been set. We set 205 um, for 2024 in the contract period of this uh, ACO, this first contract period at 0% because our actuarial team behind the, the scenes looking at pro um, projections um, felt very confident that this ACO would be able to um, create shared savings. And um, because we get a choice, it's nice to be able to keep 100% um, of whatever you do create, even if it were to be just um, 2 or 3%, although this is, you know, projections, but I'm um, supposed to be a little higher than that. So essentially, when we talk about shared savings rate, um, our in 2023 um, performance, uh, Allidade's average um, shared savings rate for our enhanced um, was, uh, was significantly higher than this too. So we have some very high performing enhanced ACOs um, across the country. Okay. And I, appreciate I just want to add one thing to that. So just on that graph, so you can see the years. This is a this is a cohort view of that graph. Mm -hmm. So. Those are our ACOs that have been with us for a year. So when you see the Y6, year six, so our ACOs that have been in with us for six years are averaging 10% savings. Yeah. Um, and so, that, that's the trend that we are going off. Yeah, and if you, like, if you think of it translated in 2023, so not co cohort view, just purely 2023 result, results, um, our earned savings average across tracky and enhanced ACOs um, if you think of it, a per member per year dollar amount back to our partners. So after Allidade's split was 549 PMPY. Sorry, that was to the ACO um, before before the split. And then um, versus the non-Allidade ACOs, which is 275 before any sort of split, which we don't have visibility into, obviously, because that's ACO to partner contract. Yep. And, and so that was... Um... I don't remember the exact figure, but 500 per member per month. Year, so 549. Year. So if you have a thousand, um, think of the ACO. If the ACO has a thousand, which is obviously the minimum is 5,000. That's not true, but just for math's sake, um, yep. it would be, you know, 54,900 back to the ACO. So if the ACO has 30,000, times it by that um, back yep. to the ACO. Great. I appreciate. I appreciate that. That helps a lot. Um, you also mentioned that you're. Um, routinely meeting quality targets. Um, in my uh, experience, oftentimes with quality targets, you'll be meeting some, but not all. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you choose to focus your quality efforts, what your process is like, um, not giving away any trade secrets, just helping us 
Um, you are a, a large and experienced um, group of ACOs. I'm trying to learn from what you've done. So how how do, do you have a process for that? Um, how do you determine your objectives and key performance indicators, those types of things? Could you share a little bit of that with us, please? Sure, I can do overall and then Krista can jump in specifically to 205. Um, so we have a quality team that, um, and you know, all the data and while this uh, Vermont is just per participating, the notch is just per participating in our MSSP ACO, we have um, other payer downside risk arrangements. So we do this quality across all of our, our payers. But for MSSP specifically, um, you know, we, we have never, I don't believe ever had money withheld for not missing, missing um, quality targets. So that's, we do overall always hit that um, ceiling and get over it with the quality. For specific um, measures and everything, I know Krista's team operationally meets um, with the partners um, regularly showing them and tracking quality results. Um, and I'll let Krista speak directly to that. You're on mute, Krista. You're on mute. She is having trouble. She just messaged oh. us. She oh, sorry. Okay. So Krista has a, an operational team. I, I'll just I'll shoot from the hip a little bit because I used to be the executive director of New England. So um, she has a team that supports her. Um, that is. Um, you know, we get our data from CMS and we track the the quality measures with. Um, the, our partners. We have a clinical team and we have the operational team. We meet, the clinical teams meet um, once or twice a month, depending on how long they've been with us and how, you know, routine everything is. And we make sure that they're on target. We have different initiatives that um, if we see, you know, halfway through the year that we're low in certain areas, we can either provide support, like she said, if they need it and they don't have the workforce to do outreach to get patients in to look at specific measures. Um, and help close those gaps. Um, or we can um, you know, have some education. Sometimes it's just purely education that needs to happen around how documentation happens um, and how processes are occurring within our partners and then we can support them on that. So we really do track very closely uh, in all of the meetings, uh, measuring quality and also measuring other important measures um, to drive shared savings. Um, thank you. I don't have any further questions, and I think we're holding questions from um, the healthcare advocate and from uh, the public until all of the presentations. And so what I'd like to do um, right now is take a 10 minute break and um, let Chair Foster know that it's uh, fine to return and we'll resume with him in charge at uh, 1033. Thank you very much. Is able to see uh, my slide deck? We can. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> hey, everyone. My name is Amir al Najjar, internist by training, one of the co-founders and uh, chief medical officer here at Vitalize Health. And once again, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today. I uh, want to talk about Vitalize and our ACO into TKS that uh, we would like to operate in Vermont. So a little bit of a background about Vitalize Health. Uh, we view ourselves as a provider enablement company. So we work closely with primary care physicians in order to help drive them from fee-for-service to value-based care. We lead with data-driven holistic approaches with our practices. We also bring in an all-in-one solution that includes upfront incentives for practices to do value-based care items that uh, may not always get reimbursed by Medicare. So we try to bring additional funding to practices uh, and resources, clinical resources as well, to help improve uh, the care delivery model, you know, uh, across their Medicare beneficiaries and their practices. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the incentives that we pay for, they're bread and butter value-based care items like transition to care, annual wellness visits, uh, making sure quality metrics are met. Uh, we also have a... Uh, clinical evidence guideline base uh, where we call it vital insights, where if we see patients having gaps in, you know, certain medications for their conditions that have been proven by evidence to be beneficial, we'll flag these items for the PCPs to take under consideration. 
Next slide. Okay, so what is our goal? As I said, our goal is to help the transition of value-based care by taking care of the docs to take care of us. You know, we really believe that by helping with a lot of the administrative things that many PCP practices deal with, uh, we are able to give them more time back to focus on the patients. And that's exactly how we would love it to be, where they're focused on patients and not having to deal with the administrative logistics and healthcare. We're also able to bring certain things to them that they may not normally have, like ADT feeds, letting them know when their patients have hidden hospital or been discharged. Uh, and most importantly, just additional clinical resources, nurses, RNs, pharmacists to help outreach to patients that may benefit from it. So we really try to take a holistic approach with our primary care providers by ultimately not replacing or doing anything they're doing, but just supporting them and areas that they raise their hand up and ask for help, we're able to deploy resources uh, there to make sure that gets done. Can I interject, Amir? Uh, I'm Brian yes, Oates. Please. I'm one, one of the ACO medical directors. I'm actually the doc that meets with the practices, uh, both in person and uh, virtually, and work with them, the office managers, uh, some ancillary staff. And we really do, I, I think, a, a great job of providing not only services, but helping them with what they're already good at, and more importantly, what they're not good at. Every practice has uh, something that they're very well tuned on. We try not to mess with that. But every practice, particularly some of the health centers, have some very special needs. And that's where we really try to, to interject and tailor the experience to those particular practices. We look for efficiencies, particularly in their processes. Uh, we find a lot that their processes sometimes are inefficient or in some cases don't even exist for a particular initiative. So we help the practices develop those types of uh, things. Uh, and we, kind of like Amir mentioned, we do provide data to the practices. And I recognize in particular that they have very limited time to spend with us. They're, you know, they're very busy folks trying to keep up with the patient flow. So we try to make that data actionable and very specific. I mean, you could literally drown somebody in data, but that doesn't do anybody any good. So we try and provide little bits and chunks that are digestible and manageable. Uh, we find that you'll get actually a much higher buy-in from the providers and office staff if we're able to do that in, in small pieces. Uh, um, you're touching this as well. I think so far, one of the shining pieces that we've been able to provide for these folks is an idea of where their patients are. And in particular, I'm talking about uh, in-hospital stays, both in Vermont, surrounding states, as well as for the snowbirds that are down in Arizona and, and Florida. Uh, a lot of our providers that I've been working with have said that I don't know where these people are because some of our hospitals are not, or either we're not connected to them through either case management, social work, uh, some sort of direct uh, feed. Uh, so it's been really valuable to a lot of our uh, practice partners to know where their patients are actually going because it's very difficult to follow up on somebody if you don't even know that they were in the hospital. Uh, Amir kind of touched this as well. We have a program that's that will be um, available to everybody in, in um, 2025. It's actually available now. It's called Vital Care. A lot of our practices, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this, are very understaffed and stretched very, very thin. So Vitalize now has the ability to reach out to these practices and help with some of the, like the patient outreach. We're able to actually, if their patient gets discharged from the hospital, we're able to reach out to this patient for them, touch base with them, make sure they have an appointment for follow-up. Uh, and it's really offloading a lot of the burden from the practices uh, onto Vitalize. And that, that is a no-cost service to the patient or the practice. Part of that vital care program is uh, additional services as well. We can look at social determinants of health. We have a nutrition, nutritionist available. We have a pharmacist available. Uh, we have access to social work. And then if your patient says, you know, if they say, oh, I ended up in the hospital because I couldn't get a ride to my pulmonologist and I ended up in a bad COPD exacerbation, we can help, we can work with local resources in the area and try and get them, um, you know, rides to try and keep their care consistent so they don't end up in the emergency room or the hospital. Uh, and as far as like utilization, 
uh, we have some access to some pretty sophisticated type things. A lot of what I spend my time with is uh, working with the practices, letting them know which of their attributed patients are high ER utilizers. And now we have the ability to even look down to diagnosis that are going frequently. Uh, there are some things that are considered perhaps potentially avoidable that could have been caught in the office, but they ended up in the emergency room. We have analytic ability to tell them what day of the week is now their highest uh, ER utilization day. I've recently worked with a practice that I was able to show them uh, they had a chest pain issue, and we were able to get down to the point of who those patients were, what days of the week they were going, and allow them to kind of look at their own internal system to say, okay, great, I perhaps I need extended hours on such and such day to help address this because I have a UGR problem on Mondays. Uh, and it also allows them to know kind of what where they should develop their resources. If they if ER diversion is a key piece, they can dev they devote like available mental and uh, financial and capital resources to try and reach these patients sooner to try and prevent them from going. Because not everybody in Vermont is going to have an urgent care next to them, or um, you know something. You, know, you may have only one hospital choice. And then we also look at uh, performance. Every practice has, you know, multiple providers. Every provider has different performance levels, and we're able to tell to the practice exactly provider A versus B, how they, how they are looking as far as here's your follow-up rates for this particular provider, here's their readmission rates. Uh, this is how this provider uh, does on recapturing HCC coding for a Medicare risk adjustment. And then at times I've gone up to Vermont and I've had like lunch and learn type things where I was able to talk with the providers, say, you know, this, this is what's changed in the world of coding. These are the things you need to know. And in some cases we were able to do targeted, if you have one particular provider, we're able to do targeted education to try and bring that provider up to speed. Because, uh, you know, they don't really teach value-based care and, and residency or medical school. So sometimes it's a lot of the newer folks who are coming in uh, that we have to kind of bring up the speed. Uh, we really try and tailor that to what they're what they need, and not really force something down their throat that they uh, they're already good at. And you know, I, I really try and not waste anybody's time because I understand that getting behind in clinic is a nightmare. So we try and make it as a, you know as basically as efficient as humanly possible. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that caller. So this is the, the information regarding the ACO. It's going to be our first performance here uh, for this ACO in 25. It's going to be a MSSP uh, level E basic track. Uh, the ACO size is roughly 26,000 lives. 1,600 of them are affiliated in the two practices in the state of Vermont, uh, Little Rivers and Mountain Community Health are two practices we're working with in Vermont. Next, let's see. Okay, so the, that's all we have in terms of slides. The next part is uh, the budget financial. Uh, should we hold on to sharing that for the private session or? Um, Mr. Hanksler, has that been granted confidentiality by the board? Uh, yeah, so um, two pieces to this. The first is that uh, Vitalize submitted some materials that were granted confidential treatment, um, included some of those materials in one slide that it uh, submitted to us. If the, the the slide, correct me if I'm wrong, Vitalize, but I believe that slide contains nothing new um, or different from the budget submission. Uh, it just contains information that was treated confidential in the budget submission. If the board wishes to discuss those uh, those few materials with Vitalize, we can go into executive session. Um, if the board would prefer to ask questions that it has and wait on whether or not we want to, you know, we, we we can do that too. So it, it's um it's it's nothing that you don't already have in front of you. Is that is the thing that I wanted to share. 
Great, thank you. So we'll proceed with um, staff and board questions. And if there is a need to go into an executive session, um, we'll take that up if it comes up. Um, so first I'll turn to Ms. Sawyer for any staff questions there may be. Sure, just one question from us. Um, so we had required folks um, as part of Vitalized Health 9 ACO, their FY24 budget order, there was a condition that um, some staff attend Vermont Blueprint for Health orientation, and I believe that was done, um, which is great because the Blueprint for Health is a really important program um, throughout the state. And um, we did ask a question in the budget uh, guidance of this vitalized ACO about how collaboration would work. Um, and it was my uh, perception that perhaps the folks who had answered that question uh, in the budget guidance weren't the same folks that attended the orientation. So I was wondering if um, you all from Vitalize would think that perhaps it would be beneficial for someone from this current Vitalize um, ACO to attend the Blueprint for Health orientation. Um, and I just wanted to verify that it wouldn't be duplicative of um, whoever attended for Vitalize this current year. I attended last year. Um, and Great. this is, the, yeah, thank you. And this is still the, uh, um, my medical unit for 2025 for uh, consistency's sake. So it would still be me. Okay, thank you very much. That was my only question. Sure. I'll open it to the board for questions. I can go ahead and go first. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, so in your submission on page 11, you talked about, and today you've also talked about as part of your care coordination activities, you partner with community folks um, where that makes sense. So I'm just a little bit curious about, uh, and it sounds like Brian, you've had some experience in Vermont with the prior version of Vitalize. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could talk a little bit about what community partners you're familiar with and how you might have worked with them um, in the past or would expect to work with them in the future. Yeah, I mean, I do have to apologize. I'm one step away from that. That is a separate team. Once we identify that patient X needs, you know, perhaps needs nutrition, help paying their bills type of thing, we have a we have a separate team that will take that from there. And I understand that team uh, incorporates uh, as many local resources as humanly possible. A lot of stuff we can do in house, but obviously we we, we don't have vitalized staff on the ground in every every county in, in Vermont. So we uh, that team goes out and kind of figures out what resources are available in that particular area and tries to address it from from there. Uh, my understanding has been very well received. I, I don't believe we've had a significant need quite yet in Vermont for this. Um, you know, it's the current attribution um, for, for last year was, you know, probably around 2,000 lives. Um, so I expect as the entity for 2025 is different, much larger, that would be a much, much bigger need. And that that department is growing quickly. So we're, we're throwing a lot of resources at it because we, we recognize that social determinants of health is becoming a very large issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in, so you spoke a little bit about this today, but in your submission on page 14, um, when you, you talk about providing actual actionable data and workflow optimization support, um, but in your submission, a lot of the focus was on the annual wellness visit. So you, could you give us a little bit more, um, information about the types of actionable data you provide? Uh, in addition to support around the annual wellness visits? Yeah, I could sure. take that up. I, I could take that, Brian. Uh, so the annual wellness visit is a visit. It's like the, we view it as a vehicle to get patients in to be checked on by their primary care providers yearly to, you know, uncover things. But, you know, so that's sort of first step is getting the patient in the door to be proactively seen. But then, you know, 
well, what does this patient need? You know, and our and you know, by getting all the claims data, we're beginning to work to ingest EMR data. We're able to bounce them. We've developed a clinical content library where we're able to see, okay, we know, you know, research shown if you're, you know, a CHF patient, you should be on a beta blocker, you should be on potentially other medications. So what we see is whenever there's deficiencies or gaps, when the patient arrives, you know, in their workflow in their EMR, we're able to tee up action items. We call them our vital insights, which are, hey, you know, Ms. Smith has CHF, you might want to consider a beta blocker. You know, ultimately it's the provider's choice. Uh, you know, there may be a reason they're not on a beta blocker, but sometimes it's just gaps and people forget and things slip through the cracks. So we're able to resurface them. So we view as the annual wellness visit, the transition to care visit. We view these as the first step, which is the vehicle to get the patient in. But ultimately, you know, things need to also improve during that visit as well. And to add on what Amir said, for Little Rivers in particular, I, I recall they did not really know how to bill properly for an AWV for because a federally qualified health center is a little different than the uh, the non health center crowd. So we worked with them to be able to do that efficiently, uh, and they had some difficulty. I, they didn't really have like an AWV template, so we worked with them to get the health risk assessment together, those kinds of things. Uh, got them all the pieces that they they need so that they're they were trying to build that into their EMR to make it efficient. Uh, and that's that's pretty common amongst the health center crowd. Great, thank you. So it sounds like the vital insights tool provides almost like a checklist for the provider to say, oh yeah, did that, did that. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Maybe I should talk to the patient, that kind of thing. That sounds, yeah, exactly. and it's, that and sounds it, about right. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, and that's based off the latest clinical research. So the the uh, society accepted guidelines, which some of the providers, you know, if they've been around for a while, you know, may not have kept up with uh, the most current uh, evidence based medicine. So it kind of helps in that regard too. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the other questions that I had are actually in the confidential section. Um, so depending on what other folks have, if others have questions related to that section, um, maybe I can ask those in executive session, but if not, also maybe uh, we could just have the staff follow up as the more expeditious way to do that. Cool. Sorry, I had a little challenge coming off of mute earlier, but I just have two quick questions, um, which one of them kind of follows up on one of Robin's questions, but Brian, you mentioned uh, digestible chunks of information to providers and gave uh, an example of um, patients being admitted to the hospital or recently discharged. I guess I had sort of two questions related to that. One is how how do you know and in what sort of temporal, you know, how quickly do you know a patient is admitted to a hospital that's not affiliated with a vitalized organization or the or the practice that you're working with? We have, uh, Amir, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a five vendor, maybe six vendor, uh, national ADT system that we work with. Yeah. Very so common we, ones. Like, yeah. yeah. There are vendors uh, like Patient Ping, Experian. Uh, we also connect with uh, our HIEs in different states. But in order to get all the hospitals covered, it's a hodgepodge of vendors. I think we're at six, seven vendors, and that's giving us around 68, 70% of all the ADTs. And we're gonna add another five vendors to get us to 80%. So uh, it's real time to your question. It's uh, you know, usually a couple hours delayed. So it's same day. You're not finding out a week later that your patient hit the ER. Uh, and you know the number one thing is for providers to know that where their patients are, but also to help tee up the transitions of care. You know, everyone knows transitions of care are a beneficial thing, but they only happen 44% of the time in many of our first year practices. And the reason is they don't know where their patients are. Patients are not good communicators. So uh, we bring these systems. So awareness and, you know, as uh, Brian had also mentioned, you know, we also have clinical team members that are able to support patient outreach if the staff is, if the practice is short staff from a outreach perspective. But it goes to this notion of, proactive versus reactive scheduling. You know, uh, historically, most practices, they just, whoever calls in, they give an appointment, their schedules are full, everything is great. Our goal is it's not just who's calling in and who's needing you, it's also people that may not be reaching out that really do need you desperately. 
that makes a lot of sense. I didn't realize that those data were available in such expeditious time frames. That must be super helpful. Yeah, it's just a hodgepodge of them because you know one vendor will only cover you eight percent, another vendor twelve percent. You got to sort of add them all up to get to eighty percent. Yep. The other question I had was, um, what other can you give it examples of a few of those other clinical or chunks of information that would help someone's clinical practice? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Brian. For the, for the two practices that we're currently working with up there, um, a large portion of it is coding. We're able to say, and my, my big passion is, I want you to get credit for the work that you're doing. And I, I really hate these practices that leave their efforts on the table in the eyes of CMS. So we can say, here, here's your patient panel. Here are your, let's say, top 50 patients that have the most outstanding codes from one year to the next. Is Are these codes still true? You know, some of them, sometimes they're not, sometimes they are. Um, so we're bringing... The idea of, oh, I didn't code for this this year to, to the practices. And they found that incredibly helpful because depending on their EMR, some EMRs are really good at telling you, Mrs. Smith had diabetes with complications last year. Does she still have it this year? Some of them are not. So they're able to use these, um, these tools to try and grab as many codes so they're getting accurate. It's because they, they want to show CMS their disease burden in Vermont. And if they don't code for it, because yeah. every unfortunately every year here, Brian, you know, so part of it is coding, and a lot of these codes uh, help inform us which patients have which disease burden in order to tackle them for the right clinical program, and making sure that our content library is, uh, you know, teeing up the right action items. But to your example of like actual clinical items, if a provider, for example, doesn't have a patient with COPD on an optimized treatment, you know, two dual inhalers. And there may be on one inhaler because back in the 80s and prior, you know, therapy was one inhaler. So it would flag that this patient is only on one inhaler and it would tee up to suggest to consider this additional inhaler. There'll be a link to the article from the Journal of Medicine, uh, you know, uh, from the different guidelines to sort of if the provider wants to see, well, why should I do another inhaler? They'll have the research and the clinical guidelines right then and there. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of it is, you know, like the way I think about our, our clinical guidance, step one is which patients do you need to be worried about and be bringing in? Who had a discharge? Who's a high cost sick patient that you haven't seen in nine months, maybe because they haven't been reaching out. So we try to bring these patients in. And once the patients are in the exam room, we then tee up gaps. They may need a colonoscopy. They may need a... Uh, a mammogram, they may uh, benefit from a medication being added or a medication in some cases being prescribed. Maybe they dementia patient on a benzo. And so uh, in, in these items, you know, we're, we just started in 24, but we've had a, a positive ROI provider. They're accepting it. And there's a lot of provider interest because it's actually shaping the care of their patients. Great, thank another you. piece, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, another piece, another piece David, okay. is um, practices have found really good value in, and like, can you tell me who's due for an annual wellness visit in the next 30 days? Because it's, it is kind of cumbersome to try and figure that out. So we're able to tell the practices, these are the patients that are still, that are due in the next 30 or 60 days. And they found that very helpful to plan their schedules going forward. Uh, so that, that's been a, a, a very positive piece as well. Can I channel my board member, Tom Walsh here and say, can you tell can you tell a provider how many patients with a hemoglobin of A1C greater than nine have not been seen in the last three months or six months or a period of time? Who should we're, be seen? We're working on that. We're working on that. So we, we're getting beginning to get the data from LabCorp and Quest and the big lab vendors. And that's exactly, you know, because that's, uh, you know, hemoglobin A1C results are not on a claim typically. or uh, And so it's either from EMR data or from the lab data and we're, you know, uh, that's been the focus in 24 and early 25 is getting that actual non-claims data and that would enable us. And that's exactly uh, the ACO quality metric of is your hemoglobin A1C above or below nine. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, similar to the questions I've asked the uh, earlier presenters, um, is Vitalize meeting its savings targets across your your locations? 
our savings targets. So in, you know, obviously we would always like our savings targets to be higher. Uh, in 23 and 24, we've had, you know, tremendous growth in across many markets and that's hampered some of our savings numbers. We're still generating savings. And in 23, we saved CMS 25 plus million dollars in savings across our programs. Uh, we are, we are trying, you know, we're, uh, Obviously, we're ambitious and we want to do better, but uh, one of the reasons that's been a challenging is due to growth, and we've still down growth 24 to 25. We did not really grow. We just working on maturing with our practices and making sure our practices are doing all the right things. But uh, that's that's one of the limitations in value-based care is, you know, the more people you add that don't know what they're doing, it takes time to, to know what they're doing. It, it hurts the group. So you know, we're trying to be mindful of moderating growth, but uh, yeah, 23, 24, we generated savings, not as much as we would like simply due to tremendous growth, but uh, that won't be the case in 25. Yeah, there's there's a lag, right? Um, yeah, new, we just found out 23 out. results in October. Yep, okay. And 24 Thanks. results we'll find out in October of 25. Great, and um, with, Quality, are there quality measures? Are there quality challenges that you've seen in Vermont that um, that are what quality challenges have you seen in Vermont? Ryan, you want to take that? Yeah. So in the eyes of Medicare, the the, the model that was in place currently for 2020, where are we at 2024 is the REACH model, their quality measures are slightly different than um, what we're gonna be in 2025, because we're gonna go to MSSP, which has, MSSP is very similar to what Little Rivers and Mountain Community Health are used to through the UDS reporting, you know, mm -hmm. breast cancer screening, colon cancer screening, uh, those kinds of things. The, um, the, the quality issues we've seen in 24 are more around like utilization, uh, hospital visits, those kinds of things. The biggest issue I've probably seen is ER follow-up for certain disease states, um, I think lately due to capacity issues. Uh, okay. um, CMS great. That, is that's... rating us on a quality from a mixture of claims and actual reporting. So they're looking at how often are our docs following up post-hospitalization, how often are our patients being readmitted to the hospital, uh, how often are our patients being admitted? And then there's also, you know, the hemoglobin A1Cs, the mammograms, colonoscopies. So they're, they're, it's like multifaceted what they look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, that's helpful. Thank you. Of right, thank you all. Uh, Ms. Sawyer, anything else from you? No, nothing from me, Chair Foster. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you all for attending. Um, we appreciate the presentation today, and I believe next week we'll have a staff overview and potential votes. So thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to take public comment um, on all of the ACOs we reviewed this morning. You're welcome to stay, and you're welcome to leave if you prefer. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I, I missed the healthcare advocate today. <laughs> no problem. Nothing from us, Chair Foster, at least at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, Sam. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to public comment via the raise the hand function. Seeing none, um, thank you everyone for attending and for the presentations, and it's nice to see everyone. We will take a break until 1 o'clock, and then this afternoon we have um, the OneCare budget review. So thank you. We'll take a break and go off the record till 1 o'clock.